that sounds like me I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my cost Thank God for the man on the middle cross For me, he went through it Love like that I'll never understand Lord knows I don't deserve it And I know I couldn't earn it But mercy rained down on this desperate man I've been the one on the left Full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living For a fight, thinking I can never be forgiven. I'm standing here today, overwhelmed by grace, cause I know who paid my call. Thank God for the man on the middle cross. The cross is where he I've been the one on the left full of guilt and regret Long gone on the wrong side of living I've been the one on the right always looking for a fight Thinking I can never be forgiven I'm standing here today overwhelmed by grace Cause I know who paid my cost Thank God for the man on the middle cross
Good, mor good morning, Dover. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're happy to see you here. We're excited again for another message on our theme on the crosses. I trust you've been encouraged or challenged by those. And we want to remind you that while there are lots of good announcements, either on the media or in the bulletin, there is a Good Friday service, and we're looking forward to that. If you're around, we'd love to have you here celebrating Good Friday with us. And Melissa has an announcement for Easter, I believe. Good morning. I'm going to stay down here, and I don't have much of a voice, so hopefully you can hear me. <clears throat> um, but we're so happy you're here to celebrate Palm Sunday with us. The kids are going to help us celebrate in a few minutes. But I wanted to share with you something for our families to do this week. Um, we are going to hand these out to our families. It's just a, a reminder of the path that Jesus walked this week, years and years ago for us. And so we would like to encourage our families to use this this week to help your kids remember um, Jesus' journey for us. So it's just a little fun scratch-off thing. <laughs> so you take a little coin and you scratch off the silver, the first circle, today. And then you do one each day um, till, till Easter Sunday next week. And underneath you will find some verses and a little prayer prompt. So it's not something that will take a long time, but I think the kids will really have a lot of fun with it. And it will be a great chance just to pause and remember what Jesus has done for us this week. Um, so we're really excited to share this with you as families. If you are a teenager or even older and you think this is something you'd really like to do, I did have Amy print some extras. So Joel's going to hand them out while I'm talking. Um, take one for each kid because we don't want kids fighting over them. <laughs> we want this to be a happy thing. So take one for each kid so they can all do their own scratching off. <laughs> but um, just take the opportunity to remember this week and read some scripture and pray together. Um, when you're done, I put my contact information on the back. Just have your kid take a picture holding their completed path and send it to me so that I can celebrate with them, okay? So if you have any questions, talk to me afterwards. I'll try to be in the back. If we run out, I'll print extras and get them to you, but I think we should have enough. So thank you very much, and we're so excited to celebrate Palm Sundry. It is. It's Palm Sunday. And so we'd like to start off with a scripture verse from Mike. And then as the kids start walking in with the song, we'd like you to join and stand with them. So from a reading from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, if you want to read along, Isaiah 43 through 5. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken.
prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord. Continue with our reading of the cross. And when valleys are lifted up and mountains are brought low, everyone, everyone gets to see Jesus. That's our hope for you today, that you will see Jesus. Good morning. In the last weeks, we've been looking at the crosses at the crucifixion. Today, we want to look at the place of the crucifixion, Golgotha. The hill was just outside the city and real significant both to the Romans, but also to God and us as his people. To the Romans, it was important because it was close to a main road leading into the city. They wanted people to look up and see what happens to criminals, to place fear in them, to not mess with Rome. To God and to us, we see something that brings us peace and relief. You see, in Exodus 29, verse 14, and Hebrews 13, verse 11, the sin offering had to be done outside the camp or city. Jesus, as the perfect lamb, and our sin offering had to be offered outside the city. When he was taken outside the city, the Jewish leaders thought they were cleansing the city of blasphemous impurity. But the reality was far more significant. As Jesus was taken out of the city to be crucified, he was taking their impurity on himself. That is what the writer of Hebrews is drawing with the parallel where the sacrificed animal was taken outside the city. The message to the Jewish Christians is immiscible. 
Jesus has taken the place of those Old Testament sacrifices, and his crucifixion outside the city proved that. But if they were to share in his sacrificial death, they too must turn their back on the temple and all that is in Jerusalem represents, and bear the disgrace that Jesus himself bore. Because Jesus as the new temple, there is no salvation to be found within the sacrificial system, but only in him. And for us, we also find it tempting to cling to the things of this world, but Jesus is not home in Jerusalem, so we also are not home in this world. We look for a better world that is still to come. It's only because Jesus bore our sins outside the city on a hill called Golgotha that someday we can go into that holy city, the New Jerusalem.
People shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. You may be seated. morning we'd like to welcome everybody uh, for me the cross in a lot of ways we've heard a lot about the cross but it points to how much God loves us and it only says uh, 500 times in the Bible he mentions the word love only 500 times and What he did for us is basically said to us, I love you, follow me. I love you, follow me. Join me in prayer this morning. 
Lord, I just thank you for what you've done on the cross for us, that we have salvation and that you promise that we join you in heaven where you, where you are and that you love us that much. In the scripture, you, you said a new commandment I give to you, love me and love each other. And I just pray that we as a body can do that well, love you and love each other. Lord, I just pray for members of our body. Uh, I pray for Steve and Pam Mason. Uh, Pam uh, just lost her father. We pray for Justin and his journey. Uh, we just pray that you'll be with them in their journey. Lord, we pray for Taryn Menning uh, and Deb and John. Taryn's going to a, a journey with cancer, and we just pray for healing for her, uh, but we pray for their family. Uh, pray for Roger and Margaret Rogger. Uh, we pray for Margaret uh, and Roger and their journey, which is not an easy journey for Roger. We pray especially for Mel and Julie Ellsbury this morning. Her granddaughter, Lauren, is going through some real health issues. We just pray for healing there as well. Uh, and at the same time, we pray for their new little granddaughter, Paisley. Pray for John Skideman. Uh, pray for continued healing. And uh, we just pray for your faithfulness in his life. Uh, we pray for Mary Block. Mary has uh, uh, hurt her leg. And we pray that you'll continue to help with her mobility. We pray for the elderly in, in uh, Landsmere, uh, Art and Shirley Vogel, Pat Pals, and Bev Ma. We pray that you'll, you'll be with them. Uh, continue to uh, comfort them, but be with them in, in their journey. Lord, we pray for the service this morning. We pray for Dan as he presents the message to us. I just thank you for everyone here and for the love that's displayed here in your name. Amen. do. Um, Tuesday, I was uh, kind of thinking that we might not have church today because I looked at the weather and we were going to get 12 inches this weekend. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, I was a little hopeful. Um, and when I got to church this morning, I thought maybe we shouldn't have church today. Uh, but I knew at that point we were already pretty committed. So um, it's good to be here. I'm glad you're here um, to start uh, I want us to pray. Uh, I'm going to be up here. I'm going to kneel, but I want us to pray that God would speak, because um, that's why we're here. We need to, we're here to fellowship with one another, but we also need to hear from God. So let's pray together. I'm going to pray silently. I would encourage you to do the same. Just ask God to speak this morning. Lord, we do pray that you would speak, for your words are life, and we need them, Lord. Amen. And now I would ask you to pray for yourselves. Pray for yourselves that you would be ready to receive, because the word may be spoken, but unless we're ready to receive it, uh, yeah, it'll fall on hard soil, soil not ready to receive it. So please pray for your own hearts. Lord, we are your children. We are dependent on you for everything. And so we do ask that you would speak to us, Lord. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, thank you, worship team. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Melissa and Joel, for kind of what you guys have done to 
lead us in worship to this point. Um, yeah, this is just a part of the service. So you may be saying, Dan, I've already heard from God um, at this point in the service, and if so, that's great. Uh, I do want to say so. I'm a procrastinator, um, and so I didn't have notes ready uh, in time to get in the bulletin. So if you want notes, a uh, sheet of paper that's kind of got an outline and stuff, in the back, um, out in the foyer there on the table, if you walk straight, there's a sheet there with notes. Uh, and I will tell you right now, the PowerPoint, which was also procrastinated, is not a good foundation for notes. Um, just that's the way it worked out. So if you want notes, I would go get some right now. Um, and when you look at it, if you already did grab one, if you have one, uh, there's not half the Bible on there as far as references, but it might look like it. I want to encourage you that we're not going to read those. Um, those are on there for you to look at uh, during the course of the day, the week, um, whatever you want to do. Whatever, whatever's spoken up here is only valid if if it's God's word. Um, so it's not valid because somebody stood up here. It's not valid because somebody has a degree who spoke it or whatever the case may be. It's valid if it's God's word. So a lot of those references are on there that you can, you can go back and check or you can process and it can help to develop a thought. So uh, yeah, notes are back there. Yeah, hopefully those, uh, those help you. So to start, um, I want to tell you that sometimes when we look at something, we need to look a little closer um, to truly, truly grasp what's going on. There's an initial impression, um, but then there's more behind it. So, Evelyn, would you take us to the first one? So, we've got a picture up here. Just shout out. What do you see? Frog. Frog. All right, Evelyn, go to the next one. Did you see that there was a horse? Okay, go to the next one, Evelyn. What do you see? fish. Okay, go ahead, Evelyn. Nothing changed about what you saw other than your perspective of it. Um, it in our case, it took rotating the picture. Uh, maybe it took tilting your head or something, but there was more there than what you initially had the impression of. Go to the next one, Evelyn. All right, tell me what you see. All right, some people see a saxophone player. What do the others see? A lady's face. Yeah, they're both there. Um, but again, you kind of have to, you focus in on one and then you shift your focus and you see the other. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, if you have a stiff neck, don't do this, but shake your head back and forth and see. Do you see anything? Are you seeing it? You got to shake it pretty fast. It's there. Shake your head fast. Do you see it? So on the left side, on the left side, there is a person. On the right side, there is a, like a triangle thing with a sunset going on. I'm going to assume you saw it and that the shaking your head no didn't mean no, I didn't see it. So, yeah, I don't. Sean, was that working, doing this? All right, so Sean was doing this. Apparently that helps. I wish there was a camera up here pointed out because that would be really cool. So again, um, what we initially see, there's sometimes more to it. Uh, we can come away with an initial impression, but there's more to it than just that. So it's Palm Sunday today, and this is the time in the, the calendar where we remember Christ coming into Jerusalem. Uh, he's coming into Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. People are celebrating. Um, but the sermons we've been doing up to now have been all focused on the cross. We, we've jumped past the triumphal entry. We've focused on the cross, and that's what we're, we're doing again today. Um, so the sermons we've had, we've, Merlin talked about Jesus and his suffering uh, the physical suffering, what he went through, um, just the agony and the horrendous nature of that. Um, we had Ron Wheeler who talked about Peter and the cross, um, and really Peter and us and the cross. And then we had Josiah and Sam and Tim Trinagel last week talking about the criminals uh, on the, the two crosses next to Jesus. And 
today we're, we're going to focus on the cross again. Um, you can go to the next one, Evelyn. But this one is, this is Jesus on the cross. This is not about the, the physical suffering. Um, Merlin did a great job. And I say great. Uh, it's something that can be hard to hear, what Jesus went through physically. Um, but today we're not focusing so much on the suffering, um, but we're looking at what did Jesus do while he was on the cross? What did he do? Go ahead, go to the next slide. Um, so in your notes, there's, there's seven things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. So you can look up these references. Um, we're not going to do all of these. Go ahead, Evelyn, to the next one. So we're just going to focus in on that one. John 19, verses 26 and 27. So this is one specific thing. Um, but before we focus in on that, we're going to read, we're going to read this portion of John in its context, so you can see how it falls. Go ahead to the next one, Evelyn. Um, if you can't read it, uh, I apologize. This is John chapter 13 through 21. So John is the book of John is 21 chapters long. Um, so this is the last nine chapters. John. Out of his 21 chapters, he spent nine of the chapters on Jesus' last 24 hours prior to his death and then his resurrection. So John spent three years with Jesus, and he hones in on really that last day. That is the bulk of what John wanted to share with us um, about Jesus' life. So we're going to focus in on chapter 19. So... The Crucifixion and Death, chapter, or verses 16b through 37. So I'm going to have you stand up. And you're going to read with me. I'm going to read, I'm going to read the normal parts. You guys are going to read anything that's underlined, okay? So just so you know, those specific verses, they're going to be in italics. So as we're reading through, when you see an italicized part, that's those three verses. That's what we're going to focus on, but we're going to read... Uh, the context around that. So, all right. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, then he said to the disciple, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. 
So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. Okay. Thank you. You may be seated. So I didn't say this beforehand, um, but in the book of John, you saw the phrase in the italicized part, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, That phrase happens six times in the book of John. Um, and it's at the end of the book, the, the author reveals that he's, he's talking about himself when he says that. He, he never says who he is. Just at the end, he says, and he talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved, and then he says, this is the one who's writing to you. And so, uh, there is some debate over who that is, um, but I came across this quote, uh, and it says, in the face of Various opinions. It's difficult to be dog, dogmatic, meaning to say with absolute certainty who, who, it, who this is, but it is reasonable to suppose that the internal and external evidence points to John, the apostle, as author. So that's John, the brother of James. That's John, one of the inner three of Jesus' disciples. And so, just so you know, I'm going to refer to the disciple as Jesus loved as John. Um, and John, when he wrote the gospel uh, near the end, in chapter 20, he, he puts in these two verses, which are great. He tells us exactly why he wrote the whole book. He says in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he said, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So everything he writes in that book is for this purpose, that we can see that Jesus is God's Son, that he is the, the Christ or the Messiah, the Savior, and that we can respond to that, that we can believe in him. So that's John's whole purpose. So as we get into or as we look at this, um, that's what I want for us to be able to see. So let's dive in a little more. All right. So in this passage, chapter 19, verses uh, 25 through 27 that we read, uh, we've got a few main characters, I'll say. So, Evelyn, you can go to this. So, the people in this exchange, we have Jesus. Uh, There's some women there, so there were four women in particular, but the one we're going to focus on is Mary, uh, Jesus's mother. And then the last one is John. So, Jesus is, he's on the cross. Um, Well, sorry, let me back up. Leading up to this point, we're never told what happened to Joseph. Mary's husband, uh, the man who took Jesus to be his wife, even though she was found to be with child. We're never told what happened to him, but based off the information here, he's not in the picture anymore. The easiest assumption is that Joseph passed away. There's no record of that, but Joseph's not there. So we're going to say Mary is a widow. Uh, And in Israel, widows, excuse me, were were a people of particular concern in God's eyes. You'll see in the notes there, there's a few references in Deuteronomy. There's one in Psalm of God specifically calling out the welfare of widows. Uh, He often puts them together with the orphans, uh, puts them together with aliens. So widows were of particular concern, and that has to do with the fact that they really didn't have a means to provide for themselves. They didn't have advocates. Um, as a woman in that society, your rights were not the same uh, as that of a man. And so a widow who is not in the prime, she potentially couldn't be married anymore, so she was a vulnerable person. And so that's where Mary is at this point, as best we know. Um, and then one other item of note This one is in your notes, so if you want, go ahead and flip there. This is in John chapter 7. 
One other item of note leading up to the cross. Um, So Jesus had at least four brothers and at least two sisters. We know that from the book of Mark. And so this leads into this. John chapter 7, verses, uh, I'm going to read 2 through 5. Now the the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers, Jesus' brothers, said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. So Mary's got four four other sons, biological sons. But as the oldest, Jesus is the one responsible for his mother. Um, He's in the position of action. He's the caretaker of Mary's well-being. And his brothers don't believe in him as Messiah. So spiritually speaking, they are... They are lost. Um, these are the people that are going to be caring for Mary, are going to be leading her. And so we have Jesus on the cross here, and there's this, he's going to die. He, it's obvious to all at this point, he knows it. Um, so there's action to be taken. When we think about what Merlin preached about, the suffering that Jesus was in, Jesus is on the cross when this exchange happens. Um, I wrote some passages in there of the specific things, Jesus being flogged, Jesus having the crown of thorns on him, um, Jesus being nailed to the cross. He's in the middle of all of these things, the physical brute, the physical agony that he's in, and uh, yet here's the situation to be dealt with. Well, then on top of it, there's the eternal significance of what's going on. Jesus is bearing the sin of the world. So it's not just the physical pain that he's going through, but it's also this this judgment, this wrath of his father that he's going through. And I don't know about you, but I find it easy to say um, sometimes when an opportunity to serve comes up, uh, it's easy for me to say, not now. Um, The boys, uh, for those of you who don't know, I apologize, I didn't say my name is Dan Jungle Ward, <laughs> for those who don't know me. Um, but I've got four boys. They are, in essence, 6, 8, 10, and 12. And so, any of you with kids, you know your kids want your time. And so, usually my kids want my time at the inopportune time. Um, it's never convenient. It's usually, I'm in the middle of something. Uh, yeah, I remember the dishwasher wasn't working the other day. Uh, it was a few weeks ago. And so I can't wash dishes by hand for Pete's sake. I need to fix the dishwasher. So I'm tearing apart the dishwasher, and I've got parts and pieces on the ground. And uh, one of the boys comes up to me and says, Dad, can we play? <laughs> I know they'll pick up social cues and things like that eventually. Uh, they haven't yet. But you just, you kind of look around and you look at them and say, not right now, not right now. Uh, Jesus is here on the cross and God presents this opportunity. I mean, the disciples have scattered. They're not, most of them aren't there, but John is there. John's nearby watching Jesus be crucified and Mary is there. Mary's watching, uh, which that in and of itself astounds me to watch, watch your son be put to death in this way. And they're nearby, and Jesus has an opportunity um, to care for Mary's well-being. And he doesn't say, I'm in a little bit of pain here. Uh, I can't do this. Or I've got something bigger going on, which was true. Um, But Jesus demonstrates love. While he is on the cross suffering, serving um, to the point of giving his life, he takes the opportunity to demonstrate love. In Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, I'm going to read them. You can flip there with me if you want. This is when uh, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple uh, when he was, shortly after he was born. I thought I had a bookmark on this one. There we go. 
So in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, uh, they bring Jesus in, and this man, Simeon, comes up to them. He's been waiting. He's been told by God that he's going to see the, the Messiah, the Savior, before he dies. And so reading here in 34, Simeon blessed them, that's Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And so back in John, this exchange between Jesus and Mary and John, um, we see that. Mary's in anguish. This is, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy from Simeon. His, her soul is being pierced as she watches her son, the Messiah, be put to death. And I'm, I'm guessing Mary was not much different than the disciples that she thought something's going wrong here. This isn't how it was supposed to happen. This isn't what was, um, this isn't how it was going to be. Um, so she is at an absolute low, and Jesus comes in, um, and he knows his father's heart for widows. You can see that uh, in the New Testament in a couple places I gave you references. Um, so he steps in, um, and he elevates her, uh, her status above his own service, his own sacrifice at that point. And we see God using Jesus to take care of Mary. If you remember, Mary never raised her hand. She never said, I would like to be the mother of the Savior. Um, she did not enter a lottery or a raffle. Um, she just had an angel show up and say, you are highly favored. Um, and she said, may it be done to me as you have said. So she, she willingly stepped in. Sometimes God asks us to step into something. He gives us something that maybe is a blessing, um, but there's going to be pain that comes with it. Going back to kids, that's what kids can be a lot of the time. It's a blessing that we really want, and yet it's also a source of great pain um, in our lives when we see them struggle or have hardship or wander away from the faith. Um, but God is bringing full circle, I'm going to take care of you, Mary. I picked you for this role, um, but I'm going to take care of you. And so Jesus, he speaks to John and says, John, she's your mother. She's for you to take care of. And when he does this, Jesus does something that uh, I think highlights a principle for us. Jesus doesn't say, go find your other sons. Um, he hands her off to one of his disciples. It was more important that she have somebody who would care for her spiritual well-being than just care for her physical needs. Um, and John was going to do that. Like we said, Jesus' brothers at that time had not put their faith in him, as far as we know. Now, they would later on, but at this point they hadn't. So Jesus hands her off to John, and he, he does this selfless act while he's suffering. And so coming back to this message of Jesus on the cross, we have to ask why. Why was Jesus willing to serve? Uh, why was he doing such honestly, an insignificant thing compared to what else was going on. And if I go to Mark chapter 12, verse 31, I'm going to read it. Flip there if you want. Um, I'm just going to read 31, but this is Jesus responding with what the greatest commandment is. And so he says the greatest commandment. And then verse 31, he says, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So this is the second greatest commandment. Jesus is loving Mary um, as he would love himself. But why would he do that? Why would he do that? Um, I think it's too easy to play the he's God card. I think we do that a lot. When we see Jesus do something, we just say, well, he's Jesus. Of course he would do that. He always does the right thing. Um, it's kind of like a trump card. If you ever play a card game and there's a trump suit, that's a suit that beats any other suit if they go up against each other. And so we have that trump card of, well, Jesus is God. Yes, he could do it, but I shouldn't be expected to. Or it was easy for him. Um, that's not true. Like, it was not easy. 
If you remember back to Jesus' suffering, he did not want to go to the cross. It was not easy. He asked his father, Father, if you can take this from me, please take it. So walking out in obedience, it was an act of faith on Jesus' part. So we ask, well, why, why did Jesus love Mary in this way? And let me tell you another thing. Jesus didn't have ooey-gooey feelings for his mother, his disciples, um, the other people on earth. That it's easy to say uh, Jesus loves us. Yes, he does. Uh, we sing the song, um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's an easy song to sing. But I think we, we lose sight of it. Jesus didn't have the emotion of love for us. And if you don't believe me, um, there's some scriptures in there from Jesus' interactions with his disciples and the others, but uh, I'll just rattle off some phrases. Oh you, a little, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? That's Jesus talking to his disciples. Talking to his disciples again, are you also still without understanding? And then later, so could you not watch with me one hour? Jesus continually ran up against his disciples' lack of faith. And talking to others, <laughs> he makes this comment, I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Uh, at another time, you have, are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. That is not an emotional, ooey-gooey love that Jesus is demonstrating. Uh, he's speaking the truth in love, but Jesus didn't walk around and just, yeah, have a smile and, oh, my little one, how, how I love you so. No, he, he ran up against real people uh, the same way that we do. All right, well, if Jesus, if he was walking in faith and it wasn't easy and he didn't have this love for others that was just a default emotion, well, then why did he love them? Well, going back to Mark chapter 12, verses 20, Mark chapter 12, I read verse 31, the second greatest commandment. But if I read before that, so I'll read, start in verse 28 this time. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And we see in Jesus' life, Jesus' main focus was to do his Father's will. Um, I wrote down, I think in your notes, my notes are a little different than yours, but I think in your notes, I've got five passages in there, maybe more, where Jesus just, he came out and he would say, I don't say anything of my own accord. I only say what the Father tells me. I don't do anything on my own choosing. I only do what the Father leads me to do. The only thing I care about is doing what my Father says. He was constant on that. This was not about Jesus coming down and showing off. It was Jesus coming down and being obedient. And because Jesus was obedient to his Father, um, that first and greatest commandment, the second commandment flowed out of that. So, when Jesus said the first and greatest commandment, he said that one's the most important. The second one comes after that. Okay? The hierarchy there is important. When we think of uh, somebody winning in the Olympics and they're standing on the podium afterward, first place is the highest. They're the ones that did the best. Second place is a little bit lower. Third place is a little bit lower. So for Jesus to say the first and greatest commandment and then to say, and the second, he's saying there's importance in the order. There's importance in the order. Us seeing Jesus loving Mary is because he was obedient in the first commandment. So, Jesus loved others as a result of loving his Father. We are no different. So, we have to understand this principle. So, go ahead, put that up. So, love God is first. 
love others is second. But if we stop with this, go ahead, Evelyn. This is religion. And I say this in a bad connotation. Religion can have good connotation, but I say this in a bad connotation. I'm using the definition of religion is man's attempt to be right with God. And if this is where we leave it, we are hopeless to love God and love others. Why is it hopeless? Go ahead to the next one, Evelyn. We sang about it today. We sang about the cross. Um, We said the words, I owe all to you. The reason that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is because God loves us. That's what happened first. Jesus on the cross was a demonstration of God loving us. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were not keeping the greatest commandment, Christ died for us. So what we have up here, this is the principle at play with Jesus on the cross. Choosing to honor his mother, even as he's suffering, even as he's occupied with um, what we couldn't do. So God loves us. We love God. That's the greatest commandment. God responds, or God equips us. God fills us with his Holy Spirit. Talks about that in John 14. Then, from there, we love others. Go ahead, go to the next slide, Evelyn. So I changed it a little bit. God initiates, we respond. God responds to that, and now we can initiate it. If you think of the the picture, you've probably heard it before, and I meant to actually get it up here, but when you procrastinate, you don't have time to do everything. Uh, You've seen it with a pitcher of water and a cup, and the pitcher pours into the cup, and the cup fills up, and then once it gets to full, it starts to flow over. And that image of God pouring into us. God fills us up, and then from that, we bless others. And if we are not receiving from God, there's no way we can bless others. That is a picture of what this is. Jesus could not initiate, he could not love his mother on his own strength. He did it in his father's strength. Um, So I want to hit on a couple of these. One, God is the initiator, okay? He is the initiator. He initiated with creation. He created. Nothing prompted him. He didn't need it. He initiated with redemption when Adam and Eve sinned. He could have brought judgment, but he initiated a redemption plan when he said, your descendant, the seed of Eve, will crush Satan's head. He initiated there. He initiated the salvation plan. He picked Abraham, kind of out of nowhere. Um, He picked Jacob over Esau. Esau was the older brother. Esau is the one that should have been the one carrying on the family line. But but God said, no, I want to pick Jacob so that you know that it's me who chooses. Not you, man. It's me. God initiated with David. David was the youngest of seven brothers. He's out watching the sheep. Um, But God wants to show us that I'm the one that picks. Mankind, you have a lot of wisdom, you have a lot of intellect, but I'm the one who who truly picks. Don't don't lose sight of that. Um, And then we see God initiating with Jesus. And again, Jesus came. He came on the cross. Everybody, all of his disciples, when Jesus is on the cross, were thinking something's gone wrong. This is not how it's supposed to be. And God said, yes, it is. Yes, it is. This is my plan. This isn't your plan. This is the plan I initiated. So God initiates, and he initiates not based off anything we do. That is what is so marvelous about these these crosses. They demonstrate that all the work has been done. We now just have to respond. So i got to look at them because I can't remember which one's on which side. Oh, it's rejection. All right. 
So we have the option. God initiates salvation, and that's our first, our first opportunity to respond is we can choose to reject his plan, or we can choose to repent, which is accepting it. So our first thing, our faith starts with a response to God. God initiates, we respond. Um, and really, we have been created as responders. We are to respond to God's Word. We are to respond to His Spirit within us. Um, if we don't respond to Him, the thing we're responding to is our sinful nature and our flesh. So we are created to respond. And then once we respond, God empowers us. God blesses us. Not because of good things we've done. Don't hear that. This is not works-based. God's response is not, okay, now you're good enough. That's not what this is meant to show you. This is a principle. But God responds by, all right, you are trusting me. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the strength to carry out what I want you to do. And now, now that we've responded to God, now we can carry out the image of God in us and we can now initiate. And that's the second greatest commandment. We initiate when we love with others. And one of the beauty, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the beauties of this principle is this strips away the response of the people we're serving. Um, going back to parenting, going back to marriage, going back to any relationship with your family. If you come out of a service and you hear the call to love others and you say, all right, I'm going to go home and love that person that shares a household with me that drives me nuts. Um, because anybody you live with on a regular basis will probably drive you nuts if you truly live together. Um, this says the energy to love that person is not found in you. The energy to love that person is what God gives you. It's what God calls you to which frees you because A, they don't need to stimulate you to love them, and B, it doesn't matter how they respond. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'll just share this. So I am divorced, have been divorced for about four years. Uh, I don't need to go on the details, but in every divorce, both sides play a part. And I want to share with you one of my contributions to uh, I'll say the severing of our relationship, was that I initiated under the expectation of reciprocation or response. So I had an expectation of, well, I will love you. I will do what is honoring to you or serving to you as long as you are doing the same. That's not God's design. That's me serving me. That's me saying, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. That is not what Jesus did. And I'll say, husbands, that is not what you are called to do. You are called to love as Christ loved the church. You are called to go to the cross, even if the church is rejecting you. And let me tell you, that's too high of a calling for any of us, which is why it's so important that we go back to God's love for us and we are just responding to that. But it's true not just as marriage or in a marriage, it's true as parents um, to your kids. It's true as kids to your parents. Your parents have flaws. Your children have flaws. They're going to drive you nuts. Um, there are going to be days where you don't want to honor them. You don't want to love them. You're just sick and tired of them, which it's okay to get out of the house and go for a walk, but when you come back, God's call on you is still to love, is still to serve, and it is too hard. It's too hard for us, which is why we have to depend on God initiating. God is the one who has to give us the strength. God is the one who has to make it possible. Um, there's some passages that I wrote down, and we can see this played out. Evelyn, 
Well, never mind. I do have a slide here. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Flip there if you would. We're going to see this principle in play. All right, Ephesians 2. So I'm just going to read it. Verses 8 through 10. Uh, And these verses are pretty familiar verses for a lot of us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This particular passage covers the whole gamut. So we see it in verse 8. We see the phrase, the gift of God. God initiates. For it is by grace you have been saved. It's a gift. God initiates. We respond. Well, what's our response? Our response is we're saved through faith. Believing Him. Believing that Christ died to pay our penalty pay the penalty for our sin, and that by trusting in him we can be saved. And then after that, God responds, well, we're his workmanship. We're created for good works. And now we initiate by going out and doing those good works. So we see this playing out. And I didn't get it put up there, but this is a one way. There is only one way. You don't work upstream with this. You only work left to right. This is a one-way thing, okay? It's not a loop. Um, We always insert ourselves at the responding to God and then proceed to the right. So that's Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. Uh, Next one. If I grab one page. All right, John 1, 9 through 13. Flip there with me if you want. John 1, 9 through 13 says this, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we see that covers those first three. Jesus came into the world. There wasn't anything that prompted it. God just did it of his own choosing. And then we see in verse 12, we respond to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name. That's our response, believing, receiving. And then God responds. He gave the right to become children of God. And that one doesn't talk about the initiate part, but if we flip to John 13, verses 34 through 35, uh, Jan said part of this. Jesus talking to the disciples in the upper room, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's the second greatest commandment right there. That's us initiating. God loves. We respond to that. He empowers. We now go and initiate that love with others. So we see Jesus on the cross. We see Jesus loving his mother Mary, caring for her provision, uh, fulfilling his father's will. But he didn't do it because he was a nice guy. He didn't do it because he's the savior of the world. He didn't do it because it was just easy for him. He did it because he loved his father with everything he had. And because he loved his father, he acted out of that. And that's what our call is. Uh, as an application for you going out of here. Who are the people in your lives that are difficult to initiate or sustain your love towards? You probably have those people. I've got coworkers, people that drive me nuts. Anytime they, uh, I see them coming down the hallway. No, it's not you, Jason. (laughs) Dan didn't raise his hand, but I was going to tell him it was him. (laughs) No. You got coworkers where if you hear their voice, maybe you exit stage left so you don't have to interact with them. Maybe you have that person in your family that, yeah, you hope they don't 
come home quite so early from work. Maybe seeing some of you as teachers, you've got that student uh, in the class who, wow, you would love to allocate them to some other subject other than yours. We all have them. Those people are God's gift to us. Those people are God's grace to us. God loves us, and he's not going to let us stay the way we are. He wants to refine us. And so to refine us, he needs to turn up the temp to bring us to a a boil because when those people come into our lives, they bring our imperfections to the surface. And once they come to the surface, now the refining process can begin, and God can skim that off. So application this week, as you see those people or think of those people, ask God, to reveal ways that you can respond to his love and now go initiate with others. And both of those things take faith. They both take faith. Jesus trusted his father completely. Even though he said, I don't want to go to the cross, but I will because I trust you. It takes faith for us to trust God. And so that is my prayer for us, that we would have the faith, the humility, the courage to step out and be a light to demonstrate that love to others. All right, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. They've got a couple songs, and uh, what I like about these songs is these songs are responses. Um, It's a response of gratitude. It's a response to what God has done for us. So I would encourage you as we sing, um, yeah, have have your eyes set toward how can I respond to your love, Lord. Thanks, Dan. Would you please rise? Let's be responders together. What a gift to respond to the the God of grace, God of mercy, who bore our sins on that cross. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song 
Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. don't have a palm branch raise your hands there's nothing like praising the, the Lord above in pain out of pain in it all
Mighty name, so let the rain fall. 